Well, I'm going to start the recorder. Uh, I just want to point out, you know, since you are already in your second uh, CISP class, you know, with programming, you might want to keep an eye on the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You know, just so that you kind of keep an eye on what kind of occupation are related to computer science. And, um, you know, I know most people just kind of skip to the third column, or the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth column, which is the median pay. <laughs> um, but even if, you know, you know, the, the median pay is good, you know, but if, it, if it's a good fit with your personality and what you're really strong at, you know, that's really good. Um, that's all I, you know, I really have to say. There are some occupations that are not listed here, um, like um, you know, specialists with uh, storage you know, systems. Um, you know, they're kind of more specialized, you know, but they're not shown here. Um, the one single one that most people look at would be software engineers or software developers. So this is one you know, field that is kind of, um, it's a fast growing field. And let's see if they have a, programmer is not okay so you don't want to become a what we call what we call a computer programmer you want to become at least you know what we call a software developer when you look at the description they're slightly different they're not exactly the same so you might want to spend some time to kind of look into these links here each one if you click on a link you know each one will show you more about that particular occupation so if you click on software developer um, it will show you the range, median pay, you know, per year is 93000 It depends on the company and the region of the, of the country. If you're in the Bay Area uh, working for Google or Facebook or anything like that, I'm assuming it's going to be more than 93000 a year. You know, the median is going to be more than that. Um, it will tell you what they do, uh, work environment, how to become one, you know, what kind of degree you need, and so on and so forth. Now the most important part I think is job outlook, okay? Because you're gonna come out in about what four or five years or so, you know, something like that. So you want to make sure that whatever occupation you pick has you know high growth, you know, so that when you are done with your education, there'll be a lot of jobs. So this one is one of the highest possible because it has a growth of twenty-two percent from twenty twelve to twenty twenty-two. When you compare this number with other occupations, you'll find that 22% is actually a pretty you know, good increase as opposed to other occupations where you see a single digit. Or in some cases, you see a decrease, you see a decline you know, over the next 10 years or so. Yep. Generally, what is the difference between a programmer and a software developer? Well, since you asked the question, let's compare. Okay, so I'm gonna open it on one tab and then open the other one on the other tab. So this one, magnify a little bit. This is the uh, for this is software developer, and this one is for program. So when you look at the description, you know a programmer write code to create software programs, which is kind of redundant because programs are software. They turn the program designs created by software developers and engineers into instructions that a computer can follow. It's and like then as opposed to huh? It's like typing it out. Well, it's the more tedious part of actually writing programs. Um, whereas a software developer, which is also known as a software engineer, are creative minds behind computer programs. Some develop the applications that allow people to do specific tasks on the computer or other devices. Others develop the underlying systems that run the devices or control network. But the, the point here is a software developer requires creativity and you know, uh, knowing how to structure things correctly, and then once everything is kind of laid out, then the programmer can come in and do all the tedious stuff. Now, the other part about a programmer or a computer programmer is to look at the job outlook. It only has a you know eight percent increase as opposed to a twenty-two percent increase, and that has to do with the improvement of tools. So, a lot of times, a software developer does not need to rely on a program anymore because the tools are so easy to use. Any questions about these two occupations? No questions? Right. Well, if there are no questions about this, we'll move on to the class topic. 
I'm skipping around just a little bit because you know I just want to get this little topic out of the way. It is not something that is not important. It is important, but at the same time, you know, it doesn't really have a lot of. We can't really do a lot of homework all by itself using you know this topic. So what we'll do is we'll talk about scope and lifespans of variables. In other words, scope dictates when can I see a particular variable. Where in a program can I refer to a particular variable? That's the scope. Lifespan, on the other hand, refers to the duration, you know, relative to the execution of a program, of a particular variable. When is it created? For how long can it maintain its value? And when does it die? Okay. In other words, when does the resource get you know, recycled to do something else? So those two things are somewhat related, but they are not the same thing. Definitely not the same thing. And I will start with the threat of global evil. And this is not a political class. I'm talking about the evil of global variables. <laughs> okay. Global variables are well global. There's there's global and there's really global, and really global variables are really evil as well. Okay. So what I'll do is I'm going to write some sample code. Um, just so that you can see, you know, why things can be bad. Now, keep in mind that all programs that you write at a college level, even if you go, even when you go to a four-year university, I would say that the most complex program that you ever write would be close to maybe two, three thousand lines of code. You know, that would be like a semester or quarter-long kind of project. You know, and that's about two to three thousand lines of code, which is nothing. So a lot of problems that we see when people use global variables is not going to be felt by you because you never have to maintain your programs, you know, any longer than a single semester. Okay, when you work in the field, then you're dealing with programs that are easily hundreds of thousands of lines of code. That's not even considered a big project. Okay, that's considered a kind of medium small kind of project. And those projects also have to be have to be maintained by multiple people over decades. Okay, I'm not kidding. You know, over decades, and as a result, the use of global variables have a long-lasting effect on the unfortunate people who have to maintain the programs. Okay, so we'll kind of set up the context because otherwise. You might see, you know, you may not see the point of this discussion because we are only dealing with small programs by all standard. By all standard, we're dealing with fairly small programs. So the first part starts with how do you declare a global variable? Well, any variable that you declare out of the context of a subroutine is global. That's simple. So let's go ahead and start with you know, some actual code so that you can see what a global variable looks like. In terms of declaration and how to refer to it, so we'll go to. Eh, I'm just going to do a temp folder here and create a folder called global, and we'll just go ahead and say global.cpp, and here's main, main has a return zero in this case. So anything that you, any variable that you declare outside of main. Is considered a global variable. So if I do an int x here, int x, then x as an integer is a global variable. Now a global variable means it is usable from anywhere within this program. So that means if I have a subroutine called f, okay, so I say void f, which does not require any parameters. F as a subroutine can access any global variable, at least in this file. So F here can increment the value of X. So in this case, in main, I can call F and well, first do an initialization, call F, and then by the time I get to the return statement, X is going to have a value of one. Okay. So global variables are, in terms of concept, is pretty simple. Okay. They are basically variables that exist outside of subroutines, and basically all subroutines have access to global variables. Are we doing okay so far with this concept? 
So that means if I have a subroutine called G, guess what? G can also do whatever it wants with the global variable X. So G can say, oh, you know what? I want to um, double the value of X. Okay, not a problem. Can be done. Any questions about you know, what you can do with a global variable? Yep, go ahead. Within main? Yeah. Yeah, I just did. Um, on line 15, oh, okay, it's the initialization. So in this case, I have all three functions within this program to do something like with x. Okay. Yep. So if you initialize x in the beginning, and then once you get to line 15, will it change the value? Yep, on line 15, x is going to get the value of 0. But up until that point, it'll use Up x. until that point, it is uninitialized. What if you initialize it outside the subroutine? You cannot initialize it like this. This doesn't work. Because all code needs to be in a subroutine. So x equals to 0 is code. It's, a state, it's an assignment statement. It cannot exist outside of the subroutine. What you can do is, in the declaration, you can also do the initialization at that point. So this would be fine. You can basically say, as I create the global variable x, it also starts with a value of 0. So that would be fine as well. Any questions about you know, the, the use, the declaration, and the use of a typical global variable in this case? Questions? Okay. But this X is not just global. It is super global. No, that's not a technical term, but it is more global than within the same file. Now, what do I mean by, hey, it's not just global within this file? Let me create a second file. Okay. So we'll go ahead and create a second file, and we'll just call that, you know, do something with X. And in the second file, I'm going to have another subroutine called h. And h is going to say x gets uh, three times its current value. Okay. Hold on a second here. Which x are we talking about? Now let's go ahead and see if we can compile both source files and see if the linker can take care of this. Okay. So we have a subroutine called h in the second file. It refers to the global variable x of the first file. Um, and just to make things a little bit more fun, what we'll do in the first one is we'll call h here. There we go. All right. Any questions about this code? I'm going to put f first. Yep, go ahead. I'm sure you're going to get to this, but right now the way the code's written, the two files are not interacting with each other yet. Correct? They have references. They have references to things of the other one, but the references are not explicit. So yes, we have a problem with the, with the way we do things at this point. Okay, But what we want to do is to find out who's going to complain about it and what is, it going, what is the message that it's going, going to use. No, the, the first thing it will complain is it doesn't know what H is when we compile global.cpp, and it will complain not knowing what X is in the other file. Okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead and, and compile first, just to see what, what the compiler is going to say. Appendic um, dash O2 for flow analysis, and we'll deal with the first one first. Now, when we compile it in this way, I'm going to use a dash lowercase c, which basically means to compile, but do not make an executable out of this. Okay, I'm creating an object file out of this. But it will still go through the compile process, and it's going to complain and say, H was not declared in this scope. Okay, so let's go back to global.cpp and find out uh, where was the first reference of H, on which line? On line 18, right? So on line 18, how do I know 
with only everything that you can see at this point, how do I know that H is not supposed to take one parameters, two parameters, three parameters, and so on? How do I know? How do I know this is the right way to use H? We don't, right? That is the problem, okay? But that problem is easy to fix. What we have to do is to use what we call a prototype. And the prototype is just saying, okay, let me tell you what H is. H is a subroutine that does not return anything and it has no parameter. So instead of using open curly brace and close curly brace, I'm just using a semicolon in this case, which basically says this is how we use H, but H is actually defined somewhere else. Is that okay? And it's very useful because, you know, guess what type of uh, text is in stdio.h? Lots and lots of stuff like this, okay? Printf, scanf, you know, this is called the prototype of a subroutine. They are basically defining how we use a subroutine, but not what is inside the subroutine. Is that okay so far? All right. So we'll recompile the program, and this time it compiles just fine, okay? Global.cpp is now compiling just fine because as far as the compiler is concerned, it knows how we are supposed to use H, and we are using H in a proper way. Okay, I'm not passing any parameters to it when it doesn't need any. <coughs> Let's see what happens when we try to compile the other file. So now we say g++ dash wall dash then take dash o2 dash c do something with x dot cpp and it complains and say ah what is x okay nobody tells me what x is so let's take a look at do something with x dot cpp and this is a really really simple program at this point um, is there any indication what x is no absolutely none right okay hmm okay well let's give it something what if I say something like that? What is int x? It's the declaration and the creation of a global variable x. So if I do something like this, I can still compile, do something with x without a problem. But when I try to link the two programs, then we have a problem. Because now we have two global variables named x and yet you can only have up to one variable of a particular name, okay? But let's not uh, take my words for it. We'll just go ahead and recompile, do something with X. It compiles just fine. So the next step is, now we have two object files. We have do something with X.O, which is an object file after we compile, do something with X. We have global.o, which is the object file after we compile global.cpp. Each one has a cross-reference, or one has a cross-reference to the other one, the other one does not. So when you are going to link the program, you can use G++ for linking. So this time we say dash O, which is the output of the file, we'll call this, you know, just simple global with no extension. And then the input now will become the object files. So we have do something with x.o and then global.o. And this time the linker complains. What is it complaining? Let me scroll, let me change the size of the screen and so people in the back can see it too. What is it complaining about? It complains about multiple definition of X. Because do something with X has a definition of X and then global.cpp also has a definition of X. And because of the scope of X is global across files, now we have a problem. Are we doing okay so far with this code? Or understanding why why the linker is complaining? Yep. Now, if you deleted the first declaration of X, will it, will it still have a problem? Yes, it will have a problem. Because if I delete the one in global.cpp, like this one here, if I delete it or comment it out, then in this within this program, the compiler doesn't know what X is. Do you see what the problem is? Yep. So as you did uh, void F, uh, can you do void X in the other? 
Well, you have the right idea. The way to do that is to put an extern in front of it. Okay. Yep. External. Yep. When you say something is extern, you're basically saying, okay, this is what X is supposed to be, but I don't have the definition of it. Somebody else has it. Is that okay? Does everybody understand that the word extern and what it means? Extern in front of the definition of a global variable means somebody else has the definition. I just need to know how to use it. So as far as this particular file is concerned, all I need to know is x is a global variable. It is of type integer. And somebody else has the definition of it. Okay. Oh, it's not the job of this file to know who has it. It only has to say somebody else has it. <laughs> it's, it's the job of the linker to resolve that. Okay. So let's go ahead and redo the linking. But before we do the we do the linking, we have to recompile, do something with X first. So we recompile. And since we didn't do a single thing with global, we can just you know, relink the two files. And now they link without any problem. Okay. Let me just show both files at the same time, side by side, so we can see both programs at the same time. So we have global.cpp and then do something with x.cpp. And now they're shown side by side. You can see that on one side, in global.cpp, it has the actual definition and say that, okay, I own the global variable x, but I am sharing it with all if, with everybody else. In the other file, which is do something with x.cpp, it simply says, oh, okay, I'm counting on the fact that somebody else has defined global variable x. I just need to know what it is and how to use it. In this case, it's an integer. I can use it in arithmetic equations and whatnot. And that's all it needs to know. Are we doing OK so far with this example so far? Okay. What if there's something in global.cpp that it wants to hide from all other files, but it still wants to remain global within this thing? In other words, what if I have y here that I want to use in here? But I don't want this one to have access to it. I don't want to you know, do something with x to have access to y. I don't want this to compile at all. Even if this guy says, oh, I know somebody has y. I want to use that y. In other words, I want y to be global, quote unquote global, within global.cpp, but not visible from other files. There's a way to do it, too. You add the word static in front of the definition. So in this case, if I say static int y equals to 0, the word static means y is still a global variable, but this time only within this file. Other files cannot see it anymore. Even if they say, OK, you know, I know somebody has y. You know, if you have y, you know, I want to share it. Okay? That's what you know. Do something with X is saying. Are we still doing okay so far with this code? Okay. So what if we recompile both of these source files and then relink? What do you think is going to happen? From the second file. Yeah. But the second file really wants to share the Y variable from somebody else. Say that it the y. Exactly. It will say nobody is now defining global variable y because it is static within global.cpp is not willing to share okay so the linker can no longer see y being shared in this context so we'll go ahead and recompile both of these programs okay so we'll go back to okay recompile global and then we'll recompile do something with x and after you recompile the, the object files, you have to relink. And the linker is now complaining. It's complaining that in, in, in do something with x.cpp, it has an undefined reference to y. 
which makes perfect sense because global.cpp is not willing to share. So it is no longer visible. Y is no longer visible to the linker. And as a result, the linker cannot resolve the reference from globe, uh, do something with X. The, the reference of Y in do something with X can no longer be resolved. <coughs> is that OK so far? So now we have talked about the scope of global variables. Without the word static, it is really global, as in any file that you link with a particular source file or the object file of a certain source file can see a global variable. With the word static, it is limited to only to that file. But it is still visible to all subroutines that you define within that source file. Any questions about that part? What about the lifespan? When do you think global variables start to exist, and when do they cease to exist? They always exist. They're always there, exactly. Okay. As far as your code is concerned, all global variables are, one, allocated, and two, if they're initialized, they will be initialized by the time it gets to your code, which also means by the time main is called, all global variables are already existing and initialized. When do they die? When do global variables go away? You can basically say after main returns. Okay, so as far as your code is concerned, they are always there. Okay, are there any questions about global variables at this point? How to define it, how to refer to it, and how to link a program that has multiple files and they want to share the same global variable? questions about that? Okay. So we have just covered, you know, how to refer to a global variable, the lifespan and the scope of global variables. And now it is time to talk about why they are in general not such a good idea. Okay. Well, let's let's take a look at the programs that we have already written. Okay, because that's already enough to show you why it is not a good idea. When you look at the way we call f, which is down here on line 21, is the call of subroutine f indicate that it might access or change global variable x or y? Absolutely nothing, right? It has no parameters and no specification whatsoever that says you know it might do something to x or it needs to know the state of x. Um, what about g and h? No indication whatsoever. No indication whatsoever. So when we call a subroutine and we cannot see that x is a parameter, then how do we know that this uh, subroutine f, g, and h can access or change global variable x? Well, you can always look at the source code, right? Okay, okay, that's not a big deal. Let's think about let's think about something like this. Okay, let's think about the void funny funny calls f, and in main I no longer call f itself; I call funny. Okay, so when you look at Funny, funny does not you know, do anything with x, right? You look at the definition of funny, it doesn't do a single thing with x. But then you, now you have to track down what it calls, and then eventually you find out that, oh, you know, one of the subroutines that funny calls will access, you know, very global variable x, right? So in general, if a program has a lot of global variables, and a lot of the subroutines you know, access the global variables, how do you track down whether a particular subroutine may modify a particular global variable? Can you just look at the definition of the subroutine in question? You have to look into all the subroutines that it calls, right? And then for each one of those subroutines, you have to do exactly the same thing. So this is what we call a call tree. In other words, if main, in this case, main calls funny, and funny calls f, 
main cos g, main cos h, and that becomes what we call a call tree, which shows the hierarchy of how a particular subroutine can be called indirectly or directly by a particular subroutine. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? And what do you think would be the size of a somewhat complex subroutine? How many other subroutines do you think is going to call directly or indirectly? Oh, it can be hundreds, easily hundreds, okay? So when you use global variables and you suspect that somebody has been you know, changing the global variable when it's not supposed to be changing, you have to now analyze not one single subroutine, but hundreds of subroutines to figure out who might be changing your global variable. And that doesn't sound like fun to me, okay? <laughs> if I become a developer, I certainly do not want to be stuck with a project where your code is written in this way because I'll be wasting a lot of my time just to track down, okay, I'm using this variable, somebody mess around with it, who did it? Okay, we have a hundred, hundreds of subroutines as candidates, as suspects, right? Um, but tag, you know, isn't it the same thing when we pass by, use pass by reference and also um, using pointers to pass, you know, something so that a subroutine can change something, like scanf. Wouldn't that be the same issue? It's not the same issue. Why do you think it's not the same issue? If I use a parameter, okay, I don't care whether it's passing by address or passing by reference, okay? If I use a parameter to specify what a subroutine can change, okay, can I look at the definition of a subroutine and at least be able to rule out a whole bunch of subroutines and say, oh, you know what, scanf, there's only one call to scanf here that can potentially change variable x, whereas all the other subroutines cannot possibly change x, right? And that makes tracking down a problem a whole lot easier because you can read the source code of a single subroutine and basically just say, oh, you know, of all of these calls here from this subroutine, only two can explicitly you know, change a particular variable. Everything else cannot do it. So that makes you know, the program easier to track. Because now, even if something unexpected happens to a particular variable, you can easily figure out, okay, it cannot be this part of the code can only be here and here and here. Because it is now explicit. You have to say, this subroutine may change this particular variable. It's not global where things can be hidden. So are there any questions about you know, why global, the use of global variables can be a problematic approach? questions about it. But that's not the only reason why I call global variables evil. <laughs> there are certain things that can lead to a lot of problems, but the use of those things is so problematic by itself or so troublesome to use them that it's not really an issue. Okay? The problem with global variables is they are also very tempting. So we are now you know, moving on to this paragraph here. Global variables have what I, I would call a temptation factor. <laughs> okay. So let's think about a program. Okay. So let's think about a program. Let's say you know we are dealing with let's say, let's say we're dealing with subroutine J here. Okay, so subroutine J already has int x, int y inside the code, it does something about x and y, okay? And I want to modify the behavior of subroutine j only sometimes um, because, you know, there, there are certain times, you know, I, don't, I wanted to do a certain thing with the parameters x and y. And let's just say that, you know, j as a subroutine, you know, has been called maybe, say, 50 times from all over the program, okay? So throughout the entire program, I have 50 calls to J, and each one already is passing only two parameters to J. Is that okay? So if I want to extend what J does by adding a new parameter, what happens to the other calls? 
So let's say I want a new parameter to J. What will happen to the 50 calls already in place in the program? It will occur. Well, the compiler is going to complain, right? Because you know, because J used to have only two parameters, and now it has three. And the compiler will do its job and say, you know what? These 50 calls, you know, sprinkled throughout the entire program, they're not going to work anymore because now J has three parameters. You need to tell me what the third parameter is. That sounds like a lot of trouble, right? So what a lot of programmers would do is to use a global variable. So Z is instead of adding Z as a parameter, which means you know you have to change the 50 calls to J at this point, they're gonna make Z a global variable. So before you call G J, you you know change Z and then inside J you can now refer to Z and do something about it. Okay, so that is a quick, easy, and dirty fix to a problem. Now, typically, Z is something that is kind of obscure. Okay, it changes the mode of operation a little bit, and people think, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, it's not really one of the main parameters to J. I only need to set it occasionally. But that's how people start to use global variables. And that they start with one, and then there'll be two, there'll be three, and so on. And before you know it, there'll be hundreds of global variables. And with hundreds of global variables and thousands of subroutines that can potentially use any one or more of these global variables, you have a big mess ahead of you. And that's why global variables are not really good ideas. Okay? Do not use global variables unless you're in one of these situations. So when are global variables not evil and becomes a necessity? Sometimes you know it makes sense to use global variables. The use of const or read-only global variable is appropriate for a lot of things like you know, when you want to represent pi or the constant e, it makes sense, okay? So let me go back here and show you what, what a const global variable looks like. A const global variable is just like a global variable. So in this case, let's say I want pi to be a floating point number. Um, I know we haven't really talked about the floating point type, but that's, you know, that's kind of besides the point, okay? So if I just do it like this, pi as a floating point number is just a global variable. Any file can change it, any subroutine can change it. So it's not what I want, okay? Uh, oh, by the way, does pi change depending on which subroutine we're dealing with? Do we occasionally want to change pi to something else? No, pi is a constant, right? So let's say that it is a constant. The, the keyword const, C-O-N-S-T, in front of the definition of a variable means this variable is supposed to be a read-only variable. No one is supposed to change it. Now it's okay. Now it actually makes sense because now I can say, oh, you know what? The, for the rest of these, you know, of all the other source code related to this program, I can just refer to pi instead of having to spell out, you know, the constant itself throughout the program. Now it makes sense. So I can actually you know, finish this example by going back to uh, do something with x.cpp, and then I can all I have to do here is to say uh, somebody else somebody else is defining the constant for pi, and I just need to refer to it. But in this case, it cannot be just float because if it if it's just float, it means it can be changed. So you have to follow the convention and say this is a const so that you know we know so that in this file we know we're not supposed to change it because if it is not const the linker will still complain about it yep so if you try to write code after that that changes pi would it come up with an error yep so let's go ahead and see how what kind of error it looks like okay so let's say here we want to say pi equals to three okay I'm going to turn off all the uh, other flags just to show this one. Complains about it. So it complains the assignment of read-only variable pi. 
So even though pi does not belong to do something with x, but the way we declare it already states that it doesn't matter who owns it, we're not supposed to change it. So if you want to use a global variable without it being changed, you just call the same. Say again. If you want to use a global variable without it being able to be changed, you should use const. Correct. And that would be one appropriate use of global variable, is to represent constants. All right, so that accounts for one situation where global variables actually make sense. It's when they're read-only and they're only there to represent constants that should remain the same throughout the entire program. Non-const global variables are also necessary in certain programs, but then you'll be dealing with programs that, are, that has to handle signals interrupts, and I forgot to specify one additional thing, multi-threading. What was the last part? Multi-threading. So with multi-threading, uh, the concept of signals and interrupts, then you have actual use of global variables that are not const. Okay. But those are topics that are typical, you know, upper division classes at a four-year university. So it's way beyond the scope of this class which also means in this class, you have no reason to use global variables that are not const. <laughs> I do not ever want to see a single program that you guys write that use you know, non-const global variables, which is a very good lead-in to, to the last paragraph. But we have been using those already. C in and C out are global variables. I mean, think about it. Do you declare C in and C out within main? No. And yet you can access them, right? Yeah. In fact, you can use C in and C out anywhere you want in any subroutine as long as you remember to say pound include your bracket IO stream close bracket. Is that right? So that means C in and C out are actually global variables. Is that a good idea? No. There are better ways to do it, but the better ways to do it would mean it is not backward compatible with C. So it is a, it's kind of like a grandfathered in kind of thing that we have to deal with, but it's definitely not the best way to do things. All right, so that's global variables and the reason why we should not use them for the most part. Okay, there are certain occasions where they're still useful, but for the most part, we don't want to use global variables. So now we can move on to something that is actually more difficult, local variables. Local variables are actually more difficult, and we're only dealing with auto, the, the storage class is called auto in this, class, in this case, as opposed to static, okay? If you don't say auto, it is automatically auto. That is the default storage class of local variables. All right, so we'll start with some you know, general discussion here. Whenever you declare a variable inside a block, which is open curly brace, something close curly brace, that automatically is a local variable. Okay, well, that's a pretty simple concept to remember. But what if you have a block inside a block and you have two names that are identical, like in this case here? So in this case, you know, I don't really care who owns this block. Can be main, can be some, can be someone else. So if I have integer i declared here, and I, you know, give it a value of four, and then I have another block embedded into here, and say, oh, we have another integer i, and this one is initialized to three. Which one is going to print here? Three, four. And then which one is going to print here? Four. Four. So at some point, we actually have two variables but only one is visible. In other words, if your local scope defines a variable of a name that is already defined somewhere else, the local definition is set to hide the other definition. In other words, inside here, when I'm dealing with i equals to three, I have no visibility of the other, the other local variable i anymore. The local definition is hiding the other one. How would you be able to use uh, a local variable 
bikes you would use a global variable, but just in the scope of the, like, let's say it goes in the words more, or the I, uh, like, there's more subroutines inside of those subroutines, but the first local variable you can use it for those other ones. Once it is when it's hidden, you cannot refer to the other ones. Are you saying that you know you have one more level of blocks, mm -hmm. and, and like, in there you want to refer to the i that has a value of four? Yeah, and then so you can. You cannot. Use, and you can so you can use i from all the way to the top of the chain to to be able to use in those uh, that. Uh, Once a variable is hidden, you cannot refer to it anymore. So at this point you know, where this where I have highlighted, you you have no visibility of the eye of the outer scope. So the only eye that you know would be the one with a value of three, which is the most local definition of eye. So how would you would you just have to use two different variables if you were trying to Yep, you, you have to use different names if you need to refer to both at the same time. So in this case, you can name I and the other one J, then you can refer to both at the same time in the innermost block. But if they're both named I, then the innermost block can only have access to the innermost definition. The other definition is still there, but it is hidden at that point. So if I'm trying to add two things, mm -hmm. Okay, so I would be dollars and, and the other I would be nickels. Mm -hmm. And I want to add both of those outside of that block or at the outermost level of that block. It won't happen. I, I, you, you, you mentioned that it would only happen I and J on the innermost block. But if I wanted to add them at the outermost block, you could still reference I. In the J. outermost block, they are not even visible. Because, okay, they're not visible and the local variable is not, does not even exist at that point. So that's a, that's a good question because it leads into the next part, okay, which has to do with the scope of a local variable. In this case, as far as this variable i is concerned, the scope is limited to only to these three lines. So outside of these three lines, I cannot even refer to this particular variable i. For this variable i, the scope is going to be from here to here, but the inner scope is going to hide the definition of this one, so the continuation of the scope is going to be here, but in the inner block here, it is hiding the definition of the other i. Is that okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and write a program that makes use of your know, local variables. So in C++, you can do something like this. In regular C, you cannot. Uh, you can actually declare a local variable inside the four parentheses. Okay. So in this case, I can say you know i is now declared, initialized to zero at the same time, as long as i is less than three. Do the following block here. Okay. And then the, in the loop here, I have another loop, which is declaring j equal to zero j is less than 3, plus plus j, and at this point I have access to both i and j. So if I want to, I can say, you know, c out i and j, uh, and then end of line, and end of line, and I'm going to give it the, uh, the namespace specification. Include IOS clean. So, return zero all the way to the end. So, what this program should print is going to be zero, 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 one, zero, two, and then one, zero, one, 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 two, and then two, one, two, excuse me, two, zero, two, one, two, two, and then exit. 
we'll, we'll see if that is you know, what it does. Okay, so G plus plus dash O local local CPP. That's exactly what it does. Okay, but the question that you were asking a little bit earlier is basically, can we refer to J not in the scope here? In other words, can we refer to J here? And the answer is no, we cannot because J. The visibility of J is inside the loop here. That's the scope of local variable J. And outside of this scope, you have two problems. One is J does not even exist on line 10. And two, if it did, it does not have a, the scope does not allow you to access it. Is that okay? Yes. So if I were to you know, um, do something like this, I don't have to worry about formatting because it's not going to work. But if you do the recompile again, it says it complains right here. And it says name lookup of J changed for ISO for scoping. And at this point, um, it should not see it. Unless you turn on you know, permissive, then it will let you, let you do it. But in general, no, you're not supposed to be able to do it. So if I wanted to do any kind of uh with both those variables from the you have to move the scope. So what you need to do, if you need to use J at this point here, then you don't want to declare J in the inner scope. You want to declare J up here. Then it'll be okay. Do you see the difference? Because with this form of code, then J actually has, J has a scope of line six all the way to line 11 in this case. Because that's the block where J is defined. Any questions about the scope of local variables? Go ahead. So it's kind of more or less global within the form, in essence. Well, it is visible within the entire block that contains its definition. Right. But it's not global. It has nothing to but do with global. That's what I meant. Like, yeah. yeah, it can be used anywhere. It has it has the visibility from line 6 here to line 11. But if I do it the original way, then it doesn't, it, it's not the same anymore. If I do it like this, then the scope of J is technically from line 6 to line 9 only. And then after line 9, which is line 10, has no visibility of J anymore. Okay. Any questions about the scope of local variables? Essentially, it is within the curly braces where the definition is. Okay, outside of the curly braces, there's no uh, way to refer to it anymore. Yep. Well, do you have to put in the headers that you don't have to put standard and then semicolon, semicolon, or C out and C in? Um, I think it's the use of the namespace, and I cannot remember the actual syntax to do. Using namespace std. So it's not really a good idea to use um, na using namespace because what this does is everything within the std namespace is now accessible without std colon colon. <coughs> Which means you know, if you use this a lot, like using namespace std, using namespace blah 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 and so on, eventually it will have a collision because they try to define the same name again. Whereas if you do not use using namespace std and you always refer to c in and c out with std colon colon, then even if c in and c out is redefined in another namespace, they won't have a problem because now you have to designate which namespace am I, are you referring to. So using namespace is a convenience feature, but it's not really a, a good thing to do when you're dealing with complex programs. It saves you some typing. <laughs> All right. Any other questions related to local variables? Or well, the scope of local variables, which is the easy one to understand. Because if that is out of the way, then we can talk about the lifespan of local variables. 
which is the more difficult concept to explain? Any questions? Nope. All right. So let's move on to the lifespan of local variables in the context of subroutines. Okay. So let me write another program to illustrate that. Okay. The best one that people usually do is factorial. Well, let's not use factorial for now. Let's use something else. Let's use. I'll just call it recursive. So we'll go ahead and define a useless, completely useless and pointless subroutine, but it is enough to illustrate the point that I need to make. Okay. Okay. So we have uh, i equals to x. If x is greater than zero, then we say f x minus one, and that's it. That's my subroutine here, okay? And I'll finish this program with a main subroutine. Uh, and then we just call f with a value of 3 and return 0. So when you look at what the program does, it is completely useless. Okay? It doesn't do any actual useful computation. Um, the recursive subroutine f uh, is recursive. It is not endless, but it doesn't actually do any type of computation. All it does is to call itself a few times, you know, and it unwinds itself, and it's all done. But the whole point is, in this case, what is the lifespan of a local variable? We actually have, you know, two quote-unquote local variables in this case, because a parameter is like a local variable with only a few except uh, with only a few differences. <clears throat> let's let's take a look at x here. X is a parameter, it is not a local variable. But it also shares a lot of traits with a local variable. The use of this name X as a parameter is limited to the scope of line 1 to line 9. So in many ways, it is kind of like a local variable because it is only visible within the subroutine that we are defining. Okay, This X is not visible from anywhere else. In other words, if I try to refer to this x in main, it's not going to work. That is not going to work because x has a scope of line 1 to line 9. Just like i as a local variable has a scope of line 3 to line 8, if I try to refer to i on line 13, that's not going to work either. So from that perspective, the scope of a parameter is kind of like the scope of a local variable in a subroutine. Is that part okay? Um, then how are they different? Well, there's one main difference here. The main difference between a parameter, which is x, and a local variable, which is i, is how you specify their initial value. How do I specify the initial value of x as a parameter? Who specifies on, on which line? The call, right? The invocation, the call itself, which is on which line? Line 13, okay? Line 13 is what starts the value of x with 3, right? Because the function call on line 13 is basically saying um, x has one single parameter, which is x, and I'm using the argument of 3 to specify the parameter x here. So that's how parameter x starts its own value. That's how it gets its value. It's from the invocation itself. What about local variable i? When do I you know, give local variable i a value for? On line 4. And is line 4 inside the subroutine that is being called or outside of the subroutine that, that's being called? Inside. It's inside. That is the big difference. Okay? With a parameter, its value is specified by the call or the invocation. With a local variable, it can only be initialized inside the subroutine itself. Okay. But that's about all the differences there are okay, between local variables and parameters. In terms of lifespan, they have about the same lifespan. In other words, when do they start to exist and when do they start to go away? That is almost the same. Global variables in many ways are easy to understand because if I declare, okay, let me just make, a, make an example here. 
Okay, G is a global variable because the declaration of G is outside of any subroutine. But then I know for sure there's only one single global variable G, right? Because the linker would not even permit me to have two global variable G. Even if one is float and the other one is int, they cannot have the same name. The linker will make sure that there's only one and only one global variable G. So from that perspective, global variables are pretty simple to understand, okay? They exist before your code starts to run. There's only one of it. It can be accessed anywhere within your program, and it continues to exist all the way throughout the execution of your program. Very, fairly straightforward. Parameters are different. In this case, parameter x as well as local variable i, they only exist when subroutine f is invoked. They are created when the subroutine is called, and they are destroyed or deallocated when the subroutine returns. So the lifespan of a local variable and a parameter is the duration of the subroutine itself. But then I used the wrong word. I, wor I used the word the duration of a subroutine, and guess what I should have used? Duration. The duration of the invocation. Okay. In this case, how many invocations of f can quote unquote stack up at the same time? Just kind of look at the logic of the program and try to figure out how many times can f be called can, how many times can it call itself before it starts to unwind? Well, let's think about it. Okay, we can actually you know, write it out and analyze this part. So we call f with a value of 3. So I'm just going to use this as a representation. This is not C syntax. This is just a way for me to represent what is, what is happening. So the first time we call f, the parameter x starts with a value of 3. And in the same invocation on line 7, i gets the value of x, which means i, also in, as an integer, will end up with a value of 3. Is that making any sense? So after line 7, it goes to the conditional statement. Is x greater than 0? Yes. yes, it is. So now we get to line 10, right? When we get to line 10, what's going to happen? What is x minus 1? 2, right? Because x is 3, x minus 1 is 2. So we are effectively doing an f of 2 on line 10. And um, what's going to happen now? We have a second invocation of subroutine f. Okay? Now the allocation of local variables and parameters is on a per invocation basis, not on a per subroutine basis. So even though we only have one single subroutine f, each invocation has its own parameter and local variables. So in the second invocation of f, x has a value of 2. And on line 7, i would also have a value of 2. But this x and this i have nothing to do with the x and the i from the, from the previous line. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Mm -hmm. All right. So in the second invocation, we get through line seven, then we get to line eight. On line eight, you know, we have a conditional statement that says if x is greater than zero, blah, blah, blah. X is what? Two. Two. And why are we not using x is three? Because you're already inside of an invocation. Because it can only, it only has visibility of the <laughs> innermost definitions of the variables okay so now we're referring now we are referring to the x that has a value of 2 2 is greater than 0 so we call f again on line 10 x is 2 2 minus 1 is 1 so now we are invoking f again but x as a parameter this time has a value of 1 we get to line 7 i also gets a value of 1 and then once again, we get to line 8. On line 8, we determine that x, which has a value of 1, is greater than 0. So we get to line 10 again. On line 10, we call f again. This time, x has a value of 0. And 
in that particular invocation, the fourth invocation of f, i also gets a value of zero on line seven. Is that okay? Yes. So at this point, we have four invocations of the same subroutine f, and the variables and parameters of each invocation is independent from each other. And that is the key concept of recursion, is you have to remember that local variables and parameters are allocated on a per invocation basis. So even though we only have one single subroutine, we can have multiple x and multiple i in this case. Are there any questions about this code? Yep. So if you were to put a breakpoint in this code, if you wanted to print x, mm -hmm. will x now be 0 or will x be 0, 1, 2, 3? It would be x is a single variable. Okay. So at this point, only the x that has a value of 0 is visible. So if you say print x, it would print 0. Now, when you return, so in this last invocation, when we get to line 8, sorry, when we get to line 8, x is 0. 0 is greater than 0 is false. So we are going to skip over line 10, and then we get to line 12, right? When we get to line 12, it will deallocate parameter x and local variable i so that we quote unquote unwind back to the previous level. Then we will unwind back to here. And then it will that one will exit after line 10, it will exit and or return, it will unwind into this level, and that will unwind back into this level. And then after that it will unwind back into the main subroutine. Is that part okay? No. So is it, on, is it unwinding once or all the way to three? It is unwinding one level at a time. But at the end. But since we have nothing to do after F, the, the call to F, it would appear that it, all, it unwinds all at the same time. Yep. So what's line 16 then? Doesn't it line 16? Back into the subroutine again? It will, back, it will get back to not line 16, but line 17, because when you return from a subroutine, you return to the line after the invocation. Oh, okay, yeah. I thought, well, isn't it being called in, in 10? Let's actually do something with this one, okay? Because I think that will illustrate what this code actually does. Okay. And here, we'll just say x gets x. I'm just trying to fold the compiler into saying, thinking that this is actually doing something useful so I can put a breakpoint on it. Otherwise, the compiler sometimes is so smart, it will optimize something out completely and not let me put a breakpoint on it. Okay, so let's do it this way and see what happens with this program. That's g dash o recursive. Uh, All right, so we'll put a breakpoint on we'll put a breakpoint on line seven and then see what happens, you know, step by step. Okay, nothing skipped. We'll run the program and now we're on line seven. This is the first invocation. What do you think is the value of x? Well, it's spelled out here, right? <laughs> Spelled out right here. Okay, so x has a value of 3, so if I single step i would also end up with a value of 3. And it's ready to call itself again. Okay, so just to be checking, just to be sure, x has a value of 3. And if I single step, this will become the second invocation of f. Okay, and x now has a value of 2. Single step, single step. Just to be sure, x has a value of 2, x minus 1 is 1, so if I single step, it will go to the third invocation, right there, okay, single step, single step, x has a value of 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, so if I single step, this is my last invocation, where x equals to 0, this is my fourth invocation. So the question, the, the other question is, can I visualize this, okay? 
can GDB help me visualize that I actually have four invocations of F kind of all kind of stacked up at this point? And the answer is yes. Okay, there's a command in GDB called backtrace, or simply uh, abbreviated to BT for backtrace. And let's see what backtrace has to show us. It shows us something that's really useful. It shows us how we got here in the first place. It shows us that main calls f with a parameter of 3, f with a parameter of 3 calls f with a parameter of 2, f with a parameter of 2 calls f again with a parameter of 1, and f with a parameter of 1 calls f again with a parameter of 0. That's how we got here. Okay. Are there any questions about backtrace or what is being displayed at this point? Now, with backtrace, there are all kinds of fun stuff you can do too. See all the numbers? Pound zero, pound one, pound two, pound three, pound four. There's a way to change your scope, okay? So you can actually refer back to, let's say, your know, scope two and say, okay, what is the value of i in scope two? when x has a value of 2. Now, we know i and x must have the same value, so i should also have a value of 2 in that scope. Is that making any sense? So let's go ahead and see how we can do that. <clears throat> and I think that command is called frame. Let me just double check. Yep, it's called frame. And select and print a stack frame with no argument prints the selected frame, and argument specifies the frame to select. Okay, so we can say frame and then the number. So let's say frame number two is the one that I want to use. Frame zero always refers to the current frame, the one that we are executing at this point. So frame two is the one that we were calling from before. And it shows us that in frame two, x has a value of two. Let's print i. And i also has a value of two in that frame. Okay, in that particular invocation, x has a value of two. Are there any questions at this point? Because you know this can be, it can look a little bit confusing. Uh, uh, so uh, when you run the program and you make something like this, then um, it starts reading from main, from whatever main tells it to do. It, it, every program starts with main. Yes. I was just thinking like I was just going. Okay. Yep. Roll sheet. Yeah, it's a little bit late. Yeah, it's a little bit late for today. I'll skip it for today. Not a problem. But this is more important than a row sheet. <laughs> this is a lot more important. So, are there any questions about this part? Some students, you know, some of you, you know, took CISP 300 from me, and you might remember how we allocate dynamically local variables, you know, and deallocate those things. That is why we talk about that. Okay, but I'm not not everybody came from my P300, so I need to make sure that everybody is okay with these concepts. Are there any questions about you know how local variables and parameters? are on a per invocation basis. Every time you call, there's a new in, there are new instances of those things created and they are independent of the past instances. No questions. So we can write recursive subroutines from here on. <laughs> now, okay, I know we are running out of time, but we only got 1 minute left. But I do have to say this part. Any non-recursive control structure can be converted to use recursion. And any recursive subroutine or any recursive algorithm can be converted into iterative without using recursion. So the expressive power of these two approaches are basically equivalent. Okay? But it doesn't mean that you know, one is, you know, they're always the same. Sometimes it makes more sense to use a recursive way, and sometimes it makes more sense to use an iterative or non-recursive way. Okay, so just I just want to make sure that you guys understand that part.
Alright, we are running out of time today. I will continue with this on Wednesday.